grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the innocent life and uh, sacrificial death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Our trust in the Lord is not unfounded. He teaches us about his great love for us in his word. The first of those lessons is from 1 Kings chapter 8, beginning at the 22nd verse. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel, spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for men who hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays toward this temple, then hear from heaven, your dwelling place, and do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. This is the word of God from the Old Testament. This gospel lesson is recorded in Luke chapter 7. It's the basis for the sermon. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And he turned to the crowd following him and said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. This is the gospel lesson of our Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, our God and Lord, fellow believers. Last Sunday night, Sarah and I went with Elise down to La Crosse to her folks' house. Stayed overnight there because Monday morning, her dad and I were going to leave early to go to the special district convention down in Watertown, Wisconsin. So I was up early Monday morning. Was ready, was about to leave the room and leave the house 
When I saw down in the pack and play Elise, our four and a half month old was awake. She looked up at me and what she normally does in the morning is bright eyed smiles. So I got down on a knee and looked down at her and I said, God bless your day. Jesus loves you and forgives you. Trust him. And immediately, with a smile, she looked up at me and said, yeah. Now, it's my opinion <laughs> that I don't think she had a clue what I was saying. And it's also my opinion that she didn't have a clue what she was saying. And yet, the word came out as it did, and it was the right one at the right time. As you and I worship Jesus with joy and consistency and regularity as he wants to be worshipped, I have a sensitivity that maybe sometimes the right words come out and maybe we really don't think about them. Maybe we don't understand them. Maybe we do page 38 like we're doing today and we know it practically by heart, many of us, if not most of us, we know when to sit and when to stand. We know what the pastor is going to say, when he's going to say it. We don't need to look at the words. And we go through the entire service really knowing when there's going to be law, when there's going to be gospel. And then we hear the blessing at the end of the service and we really say the amen at the end of the service, which is saying, yeah. And I wonder if we've really thought about it. Do we really understand what we've said? More importantly, do we really understand what God has said to us, especially through the service and the message? Now, it's not our text today, nor do I believe it's any text of the Bible that ever calls into question somebody's faith or something like that, or says you don't have faith but it's the central focus of our message today that each one of us asks, not do we have faith, but is our faith maturing? Is it growing? Or is it like that banana in the grocery store, you know, that green one that nobody buys because it's too underripe? Are you taking your faith from that green, hard banana to that nice yellow, ripe one? Is your faith that little seedling or sapling, or is it that big shade tree? Are you listening to Jesus and taking him at his every word through the Sunday services, taking the opportunity when it's offered for Bible study, and even at home, taking this message that you'll hear today, looking at Luke 7 and rereading it later today, and thinking about it, and taking it home. That's what today is about. Is your faith maturing? And today the way Jesus does it is through the story of a centurion. A centurion is a, is a soldier. He was a Gentile. He was probably over anywhere from 60 to 100 soldiers. It changed and evolved over time. And he comes and confronts Jesus, not personally, but through a crowd. And how Jesus looks at him and how he deals with him is really what he wants us to see. That your faith, my faith, can be like his faith. This is what it can grow to be and to do and to trust. And you know, brothers and sisters, the only time ever in the Bible that Jesus is amazed and commends somebody for their great faith is right here. This is the only time and because of that very reason, I think that's why God put it in the Bible for us to study. What is it that makes his faith so great? What's important for us to look at and, and to see? Because I think as we do, we'll see this is where Jesus is leading us. This is where he wants our faith to be. Just like his. And so it's all of our prayer this morning. Lord, Make our faith great. We read in Luke 7, 
There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. You and I can play a game if we want called word association. I can say tomato or I can say fruit loops and you can say all the things that come to mind with that word. But I'm curious what you would say if I said Jesus. Well, pastor, that's an easy one. Uh, how about servant? How about loving? How about kind and, and generous and, and gracious and, and, and merciful? Perfect true man. But I wonder if we really thought about that deeper. I haven't said one that's very important, and I'd like to focus on it in a large way today. Jesus is God. True God. And it's important that we see that and actually not just say the word, but actually believe it. When you see that and sense that Jesus is true God, and especially to see that's what the Bible says, at the end of the world, he's going to be the one standing as judge. He's going to be the one separating the sheep and the goats, sending those to hell who don't believe, and taking his beloved to heaven. He's the all-powerful one that John 1 tells us was at the beginning creating the world by his word. And if you understand that, look at the way these elders of the Jews come and approach Jesus. This man deserves to have you do this. Jesus, come now and do this. Excuse me? He deserves you, for, he deserves you to have this done for him. You ought to come. Well, why? Well, he's a rich man. And he's used his riches to bless the Jews. He's built a synagogue. He's been generous with his money. He's successful. He's a, he's a great military man, and he's been promoted to the level of centurion. Jesus, you ought to come do this. Jesus, he loves the Jewish nation. He's a great guy, a great person, wonderful man. Come on over. Jesus, do this. And yet through all that muck, Jesus hears the plea from the centurion, please heal my servant. And so we actually hear from Luke what the, what the centurion was thinking. He says, Lord, don't trouble yourself. And just a little bit after that, for I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. The way of the elders was not the way of the centurion. He saw Jesus as a man of authority, meaning he saw Jesus as God. The same way I want you to see him. Because if you see him that way, all of a sudden, it changes a little bit. Lord, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to come to you to approach you. That's why I didn't come to you. I, in fact, got some of your own people to go talk to you on my behalf. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile. I'm an outsider. Jesus, I don't deserve to even talk to you. You were sent to the Jewish people. Jesus, socially, I don't even deserve to have you come to my house. I realize it's really a social faux pas for you to come inside. And you can even defile yourself. It's not that you're not welcome to come to my house. But Jesus, you don't need to come. I don't deserve to have you under my roof. Jesus, I don't deserve your time. I don't deserve your power. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve anything from you whatsoever. That's what this man was saying. That's what he recognized his position before God. And we don't deserve it either. We don't deserve one thing from him. We don't deserve anything good at all, big or small. Nor should we take advantage of him. If you look closely at what the centurion says, he says, Lord, don't trouble yourself. That word trouble actually means to flay, to cut. Lord, 
Don't incur any harm to yourself. I don't want any, anything to happen to you. I don't want to harass your name. I don't want to degrade you. I don't want anything wicked to happen to you whatsoever. Great faith doesn't want to burden Jesus. And as we look at the Lord in faith, we don't want to do the same either. We're undeserving. Do you realize what we said in the confession of sins at the very beginning of the service? If you look on page 38, we said very clearly, Lord, I don't deserve anything from you. I don't deserve to be called your child. Other times we say, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. I'm unworthy, undeserving. I don't deserve anything good from you. In fact, let's be realistic. What do we deserve from God? We deserve to be sitting next to that rich man in hell. And if you look closely, that rich man didn't get, and he didn't deserve that little tiny drop of water on his tongue. We don't deserve the smallest favor from God. Instead, we deserve the flames and the terror forever because he is God. And that rightfully is what God owes us. And yet, day after day, in devotions, day after day in Bible study, Sunday after Sunday, Monday after Monday, I tell you the truth. The gospel is what Paul said in Galatians 1. That Jesus takes away our terror by taking our sin on himself. Jesus doesn't deserve to give us anything. And yet in love, he gives us everything. I don't say those words lightly. Think about them. God deserves to give us nothing and he gives us everything. The Bible says in Romans, how, how won't he give us all things in his name? That really is the case. God loves us and forgives us in Jesus, makes us his child by taking away every worthless thing from our life and gives us worth in his son. When you realize that, when you realize what your God has done for you and me, really for every single person in the world, that makes us not want to trouble him. In fact, that makes us want to honor him all the more. Not to say, Lord, what can I get away with? How far can I go with my girlfriend or boyfriend on a date? How fast can I drive on the roads before it's a sin? And while it's not a sin to wear shorts and a t-shirt to church, Christians for years, for centuries have said, boy, if I'm coming to meet God face to face at church, I want to put on my best. Lord, I don't pretend to know your every word. I may have read the Bible time and time again, five, six, ten times through, but you know what, Lord? I know I can learn new things every time that book is opened. I need to be in that Bible study. And so I don't think I know it all. And so I don't think, well, church is good enough for me. Lord, to do honor to your name, to not trouble you, is to actually trust you and honor you in every way. Great faith, great faith, trusts God and his every word. That's what the centurion was doing. He says, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Oh, God knows we're so undeserving for everything and that's why we come and worship him. Because he in his generosity gives us everything in the cross and everything for our life. If that's the case, though, why is a centurion commended? Why does Jesus say he has great faith? Oh, we recognize we're so undeserving, just like he did. We say the same words, and I, th I think we believe them. Why does Jesus commend him? We see Jesus as the Messiah, the answer to the Old Testament. Why is this man's faith commended as being a great faith or even so great a faith? Is it because of he was humble? Well, yeah, but that's not the entire answer. 
Is it because he gave up on his pride? Is it because he trusted Jesus at his word? Yeah. The real answer why Jesus commends this man is because knowing he was so worthless, knowing he was so unworthy to come to Jesus at any point, this man, in faith, still dared to ask. He still dared to trust his Lord that he could come and that Jesus would listen and that even though he is the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, holy and perfect, just and righteous in all of his ways, created the world by his powerful word and that we are so worthless before him that in faith he trusted and took his simple plea and laid it at Jesus' feet and said, Lord, I know you can answer this prayer even at a distance. You don't have to come to my home. And Jesus' response, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. The amazing thing about Jesus' response, sometimes Jesus looks right into the heart and he sees faith. He doesn't do that here. This isn't a miracle that Jesus can see right in there, even though he could if he had wanted. The beauty about this section is that Jesus didn't look in his heart, but the character and quality of his faith was on display through his conduct, meaning what he believed was actually practiced by what he said and how he conducted his life. In fact, that's what Christians have done for all time too. What did Abraham do? Well, you're going to have a kid at, the, at your very old age. Okay, God, I trust you. What did Joseph do when he was sent to prison? Brothers betrayed him, sent him off into slavery. If you read in Genesis 50, when he had the opportunity to get back at his brothers, he wept. God did this to save many lives, he said. He trusted God. What did Moses do when he's leading the Israelites around like a maze in the desert for 40 years? God said, well, just, just talk to that rock and I'll get you water. Uh, rock, could you uh, please bring some water out? Boom. He trusted God. What did Hannah do in the Old Testament when she had that son Samuel she so longed for and yet after he was weaned at such a young age, she trusted the Lord and sent him to a prep school under Eli at the temple. What an amazing faith. Hezekiah in the Old Testament, when his life was on the line and he was about to die, prayed to the Lord, dared to go to God and to trust him, and God granted him 15 more years. Great faith. What did Paul do? Galatians 1 continued to preach the gospel day in and day out, not knowing if people were going to kill him, not knowing he heard about all these plots, not knowing if they were going to pick up stones and whip him at him, not knowing if they were just going to say their snide remarks and rip on him right to his face, oh, you bumbling babbler like they did in Acts 17. He simply day after day trusted God and preached how did their faith go from being that green faith to that mature one? They read their Bibles and they trusted Jesus every word because he has authority as true God. Lord, make our faith great. He can do that same thing for you as you day after day listen absorb and soak up his word and take him to be full truth. So God bless you and your day. Jesus loves you and he forgives you. Trust him. And we say, yeah. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with a glad heart. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace.